Okay, tonight's uh, uh, topic is going to be on the 100th anniversary of the 1BCG. Uh, just wonderful conquering the Atlantic uh, some 100 years ago. And to that end, we're going to cover uh, these topics. So wireless before 1921, in other, in other words, what was going on before the, uh, the event. Uh, and then we'll talk about the 1921 Transcon event. Uh, that has been covered a zillion times over uh, the last uh, 100 years. So we won't spend a ton of time on that, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll give it a good uh, uh, refreshing for uh, all of you out there. Kind of new is a, uh, a look at the impact of the success of the program. And I think uh, that's going to surprise a lot of people. And then a, uh, something else new is we're going to uh, apply new technology to uh, old data. And uh, uh, Mark is going to uh, uh, do that portion. Then we're going to talk about uh, the 75th anniversary on air event that took place in 1996. Uh, very well done. You'll be interested in uh, learning about that. Uh -huh. And then finally, we'll uh, uh, learn about uh, plans for the 100th anniversary uh, activities. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so what happened uh, in the interim between, say, 1900 and 1921, uh, before the successful trans contest did take place? Well, in 1901, I think everybody is familiar with the fact that uh, Guglielmo uh, Marconi uh, heard the famous uh, letter S in Newfoundland all the way from uh, uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, that was a big deal. It wasn't earth shaking in uh, ending up with a very useful activity. Was one letter and kind of shaky at that. So after uh, uh, Marconi made his famous letter S. Uh, we had uh, good progress in communicating across the Atlantic. The main uh, transmitter at that time was the Alex Anderson alternator of 1916, 17. Uh, but that was still all uh, done at uh, very low frequencies. Uh, we had the uh, big transmitters, big antennas, and we had the controversy of long wave versus uh, short wave. The experts at uh, communications back then uh, would tell you that if you wanted to uh, communicate long distances, you used a long wavelength. That was just understood to be true. Nobody argued with it. Uh, so people were operating uh, at that time Oh, way down low, uh, oh, 17 kilohertz, 25 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz, and, uh, you know, thinking that was the, uh, the way to go. Ham radio operators were kind of stuck on uh, short waves. At one time, it was thought that uh, the amateurs were given short waves as a recognition for all of the wonderful work that they did during uh, World War I. Uh, but uh, it turned out it wasn't that way. Uh, many of the commercial boys uh, wanted to get rid of uh, the amateurs and get them off their frequencies, stop interfering with uh, shipboard communications. And so finally the uh, government said, yes, we'll do that. Uh, we will reward the amateurs with their own frequencies at short waves, uh, 200 meters and down. So that was uh, kind of the dividing line for a long time. Uh, the short wave people, the amateurs stayed above 200, below 200, sorry. And the commercial boys uh, stayed at 200 and, uh, and lower. And they did that for, uh, for quite, uh, quite some time. Uh, but the amateurs were never kind of uh, uh, convinced that they're being stuck on uh, uh, 200 meters and down was a bad thing. And they were out to uh, kind of prove it. Uh, 
In fact, there were many, many attempts, kind of informal attempts to, uh, to prove that short waves uh, would work. You could communicate long distances on short waves. So the idea of hams doing that uh, was a decade old by the time uh, 1921 came along. It took the editor of Everyday Engineering Magazine, Mr. M.B. Sleeper, to uh, kind of formalize a plan. And the plan was, how do we prove that uh, short waves can communicate over long distances? And Mr. Uh, Sleeper uh, started uh, actually devising very sophisticated tests to make that happen. Unfortunately, uh, Everyday Engineering Magazine uh, folded. They went bust. No money. Uh, so Sleeper lost his uh, backing and eventually went to the ARRL and said, uh, hey, we've got this plan started. How would you like to uh, uh, run with it? ARRL said yes. They just happened to be planning their first uh, ARRL national convention. And he said, this is a good time to, uh, to start introducing that idea. Uh, the ARRL correctly concluded that early uncoordinated attempts were unsuccessful due to poorly designed receivers and lack of experience in HF. What they didn't say was on the UK side. Uh, the reason it wasn't working is because, uh, and they didn't want to say this, but they didn't think uh, the UK was really uh, up to the task. Uh, so therefore, it was decided almost immediately that the US should send a qualified operator with superior equipment to the UK in order to assure a successful transatlantic test. Selected was a very well qualified Paul Godley, amateur called 2ZE, uh, who would take his famous, he was the designer for Paragon uh, receivers. He designed the Paragon regenerative receiver uh, products. And he also took with him, planned to take with him an Armstrong Superhead. And this is Paul Godley. He was the traffic manager for the uh, ARRL. And it turned out the official receiving station ending up in Scotland for the, for the test. This is a receiving site that uh, Paul Godley used in uh, uh, Scotland. And he used a brand new, newly designed beverage antenna, which we'll hear uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot about here in a, a little bit. Here's the uh, Paragon RI-10 regenerative receiver. This is not an RI-10. This is typical of a, uh, a regenerative receiver designed by uh, uh, Paul Godley and used by him in uh, Scotland. And this is a, uh, uh, a super hat uh, receiver, uh, the receiver used in Scotland by Godley. Kind of interesting uh, to look at this today because uh, you notice a complete lack of uh, any IF transformers. All the many, many, many IF stages were RC coupled. Selectivity wasn't uh, the big deal initially back then. It was uh, sensitivity. And here's a, uh, a look at one of the super hat, uh, Armstrong super hats we have at the museum today. This is not the one used in uh, Scotland, but uh, very similar, same parts, uh, same layout, uh, et cetera. It was kind of a big deal. The transatlantic tests were well publicized uh, in both amateur radio publication, professional publications, and just plain uh, news broadcast. It was kind of uh, you know, a happening, if you will, uh, literally all over the country, uh, all over the, the world, we should say, uh, both in the US and in, uh, in Europe. People were very interested in the, uh, in the test and what, uh, what was going on. There were people getting ready all over to uh, uh, take part. Those taking part on the U.S. side in the transmitting side just happened to be five uh, good amateur radio operators 
they were highly skilled, they were very technical, and they looked at each other and said, we better make sure this works. Just like Godley is going to have a really, really good receiving setup in uh, Scotland or in the UK, uh, was the thinking at that time. So we better have a very good transmit uh, capability over on our side. So five members of the Radio Club of America uh, just took over and they said, uh, let's build a really good transmitter and uh, make sure this thing is going to work. So that's what they did. Uh, and there they are, Armstrong, Amy, Grinnan, Inman, Cronkite, Burghardt, uh, five very famous uh, uh, amateurs at the time, probably Edwin Armstrong, uh, the inventor of the uh, uh, feedback and the super hat uh, uh, circuit FM. Uh, he was part of the, uh, uh, just a bunch of amateurs getting together to make this happen. And here they are building the antenna uh, to use at station one BCG, November, 1921. This is only weeks before the, uh, the activity. So they had a lot of work to do in a very short uh, period of time. This is the one BCG ham shack. Uh, Burkhardt, by the way, that's, that was his call sign. Uh, so they use his call sign because yeah, it's his land. It's his, hand, it's his shack in the middle of the, uh, underneath the antenna. They had to move the shack. They just did a tremendous amount of work. The shack was in the wrong place and they had to move it with horses, of course. Uh, so here's the cage antenna, and we're going to hear a lot more about this uh, uh, a little bit later. Here's the transmitter. Uh, started out as uh, design that Armstrong wasn't very pleased with. He said, we got to change this to a little better, more stable design with a separate oscillator and a separate, then a separate uh, driving a separate PA. And this is what they ended up with. Uh, there are laying horizontally on the, the table are four 204s. Uh, one is an oscillator and three in parallel as the uh, final amplifier operating at about uh, 230 uh, meters. And just in the lower uh, right-hand side, you can see the top of the motor generator set that was used to uh, supply B+. So we talked about making sure they had a plan. And this is where uh, the 1921 transatlantic test beat every previous uncoordinated, uh, not fully thought out testing. These people really put this together. So look, let's look at the test on the transmitting side. We knew they could not just put a whole bunch of stations on the air simultaneously and start calling. So the first thing they wanted to do uh, was qualify stations. And through kind of a, uh, you know, a lot of advertising through QST magazine and over the air and direct contact, uh, they finally found 78 amateur operators who wanted to compete and get in line uh, to be able to call Godly and see if they could uh, cross the Atlantic. So these 78 amateurs uh, essentially uh, did a little pre-transmitting, uh, were listened to by qualified uh, uh, stations. And if you could prove that you could transmit over land for 1,000 miles, uh, you got on the list. So 78 people uh, got on, uh, attempted uh, the test. 27 of those 78 uh, were qualified uh, stations. In other words, these 27 stations can get on the air at a very specific time and try to uh, transmit to uh, the United Kingdom. So it wasn't exactly a free for all. Just get on and start sending and see what happens. It was very well organized, very well scheduled. And each of the 27 qualified stations were given a secret five letter code group that they would send during their transmit period to prove it was them. 
nobody knew that five letter code group except the stations and somebody who kept us safe in ARRL headquarters. Uh, so they, they really put some effort into uh, making this work right. So the calling date time were preset over a 10 day period, six hours a day, and they rotated the time for equality. Now, you didn't always get the same time and exactly the, the same day uh, because of propagation changes and what have you, they wanted to make it equal for all. However, they did allow for a free for all period. And this was a special you know, hour a day of the 10 day period uh, anybody could call, but only during this free for all time. So they 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 attempted uh, that. It was very well well organized. Now let's look at the receiving site. Paul Godley arrived in the UK by boat, of course, uh, was warmly greeted by people like Dr. John Fleming, the inventor of the vacuum tube, Guglielmo Marconi, uh, who needs no introduction, and many other dignitaries. And despite a lot of dinners and slapping on the back and having a great old time, Godly sort of got the feeling that nobody saw the test working. It didn't take long for him to find out why that was. The first night at the uh, designated uh, UK receiving site convinced Godly that he would have to move. And the problem was the site was just filled with tremendous amount of uh, QRM interference from uh, re poorly designed, poorly set up, poorly operated regenerative receivers and a tremendous amount of QRM due to commercial stations with their 32nd harmonics just totally wiping out receiving capability. So Godley had to move and he selected a coastal site or gross in Scotland uh, and through heroic, heroic efforts uh, made the, uh, the change. One not so simple effort was the fact that in the UK, even receivers had to be licensed by the government and all of that was taken care of ahead of time. But uh, no, Godly said, no, that won't work. We have to move. Godly's work was kind of interesting. Nobody was going to say, oh, yeah, Mr. Godly heard this and all is well. Uh, so all of his receiving activity was monitored. Uh, I guess you say this person, uh, Mr. Pearson, uh, who was a, uh, uh, a, a you know chief operator at uh, the Mar Marconi companies, he was very well qualified, and he was going to listen and copy everything that Godly did. Godly was not told what transmitter was sending at what time. All he had was a schedule. He didn't know the call signs. He didn't know the secret codes. All he knew that six hours a day for 10 days, he had to constantly monitor and copy the bands, waiting to see if he heard somebody. And Mr. Pearson was right there listening with him. Godly turned over to the referee, uh, Mr. Pearson, uh, monitoring data, uh, what he copied, he, when he copied, he would always tell what the call sign was, what the code number was, date and time. And when that was verified and approved, uh, that station was uh, deemed a uh, uh, good, uh, good copy. So it was a lot of work. Can you imagine 10 days, six hours a day in a cold, unheated tent, <laughs> uh, just copying? Hour after hour after hour, Godly receives deserves an awful lot of uh, credit. As we mentioned before, the world was really interested in what was going on. 
so at the end of the day, uh, Godly and uh, his referee, if you will, uh, compile all of their data, what they heard, and then they would uh, give that information to the big commercial station, uh, MUU, Marconi's Long Haul Commercial Station, uh, Station EF at the uh, Eiffel Tower, and they would transmit uh, the day's, uh, day's results. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting. They had to, uh, the traffic at that, that time was handled at 100 words a minute, uh, machine sent. Uh, so obviously, uh, people, listeners all over the world couldn't copy that. Uh, so the messages were uh, received and then hand sent again in slow Morris. So everybody could listen in and get uh, and get results. And here it is. Here's the actual logbook of uh, Paul Godley on December 12, 1921. And this is the first amateur radio full message transmitted across the Atlantic uh, on short waves. And it's a very short message. Uh, you see the message says, Hardy, congratulations. And then it's signed by, uh, by all the operators. But they, uh, they did it. Uh, they were quite uh, successful, uh, uh, actually. He talked about godly logging by the minute, six hours a day, 10 days, of, uh, and all by hand. But uh, what we see here is uh, his handwritten copy that had been, uh, you know, typed up and made uh, a permanent record. It's interesting to see the, the little blue arrow there. Uh, the 1BCG transmitter was so successful and so strong that they just would just reach over and once in a while they'd uh, tap on the key and here, here they say, hello, Paul, this is 1BCG. Uh, <laughs> and they just send little messages like that. They, were, they didn't even have to try anymore. It, uh, uh, the one BCG transmitter was so uh, successful and so loud and so consistent uh, over in uh, in England. This is a, probably the most famous QST cover ever uh, <laughs> uh, ever published, and it's the uh, par U.S. participating stations that were copied in uh, Scotland. And notice there were six Spark and 20 CW stations. So that too was kind of the end of an era. It proved right away that CW was far more efficient than uh, Spark transmitters, even though some Spark had uh, quite a bit of, uh, of power. And just a side note, it's kind of early that uh, uh, early use of GMT time on both sides kind of helpful because it got uh, a little confusing. Well, are you transmitting what period of time? <laughs> and that confusion reigns today, unless you're using the standard uh, GMT time. In addition to Godly, uh, others copied the uh, US station. Uh, so stations in Holland, England, Germany, Puerto Rico, British Columbia, Catalina Island and California had quite a uh, a good communications uh, set up in, on Catalina Island. Uh, they heard them well. Uh, Washington State and one lonely little shipboard radio man in, uh, in a German harbor. Uh, he built a receiver especially for uh, receiving uh, the signals and by golly, he did. So the impact of all that was immediate. It was both a technical advance affecting worldwide communication techniques, and it also greatly uh, affected uh, the financial uh, sectors. Something I haven't looked at an awful lot of detail. Uh, it, it deserves uh, a few minutes here. So let's look at uh, uh, some of the uh, things that happened from a financial uh, standpoint, standpoint. We, we've seen this type of uh, 
activity quite common. Now, in that time, the transmitting tubes, the only transmitting tubes available that could do the job were made by a, a radio corporation, the radiotrons, the 204s. Uh, but when Godley got off the ship in the, in the UK, there were boxes and boxes of Burgess batteries and Baldwin headphones, and everybody wanted to uh, uh, get, in, uh, get in on the act. If you use Burgess batteries, it's going to work. Hey, Baldwin headphones are what made the signal so loud. So that type of uh, advertising and a little bit of uh, help to the, the companies making batteries and headphones and radio parts and what have you was, was certainly uh, successful. Uh, but that wasn't wasn't the big the big activity. We kind of have to look here for a minute. There's a lot of stuff on this one page here. Let's look at the fact that RCA's Radio Central started on November 5, 1921, five weeks before the transatlantic test. At that time, Radio Central was the largest, most powerful uh, radio receiving and transmitting site on the planet. RCA had huge plans after making a monopoly after World War I that uh, everybody's probably familiar with. Uh, so they had started to install 200 kilowatt Alex Anderson alternators, all operating around 30 kilohertz, all operating with antennas that are from one to three miles long. It is a huge undertaking. Everybody was convinced at the start that this was the way to go. Low frequency, high power. In red, we show a, a name there, Marshall Etter. Marshall Etter was uh, uh, the chief transmitter engineer at uh, Radio Central from the beginning to the end. Marshall Etter was also a very active uh, AWA member back in the, the early days. When it came time to make major changes at Radio uh, Central, Marshall Etter wrote, when construction of Radio Central started, pause, November 5, 1921, vacuum tubes were already being used by ham radio operators and researchers as oscillators and amplifiers at the lower shortwave frequencies. Marshall Etter could only be talking about five ham radio operators from, uh, you know, Radio Club of America who happened to play in the snow on December 10, 1921. That's all he could be referring to there. And he continued, it was planned to install 12 200 kilowatt Alexanderson alternators with 12 antennas uh, directional antennas to provide transoceanic uh, communications. That was the plan. The transmitters were being built by GE and Schenectady. Hundreds of jobs were uh, on the line. After December 21, no new alternators were ever installed at Radio Central. Five guys in his shack in a cold field and one guy in a colder tent in uh, Scotland changed everything. 
1922, a new building at Radio Central uh, was all of a sudden being built. In the new building were 80, quantity 80 new 40 kilowatt vacuum tube transmitters operating at a frequency. Operating at a, uh, I just heard something come over my speaker here. I'm not sure what it was. A uh, vacuum tube. Uh, so a, a new building was uh, uh, built. I think it was building number four at Radio Central. Anyways, it was a, uh, the house 80 brand new 40 kilowatt vacuum tube transmitters operating from three to 6.7 uh, megahertz. Why did they stop at 6.7 megahertz? That was as high as they could go. Continuing, another internal uh, RCA report. In the summer of 1922, so that's six months after uh, one PZG. In the summer of 1922, installation of 12 207 tubes in parallel was begun at Rocky Point, Long Island to see if they could replace the alternator. Uh, blah, 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 bunch of names and people in charge, et cetera, et cetera. And then we go down to the uh, 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 bottom of the page here, it says, operators at Nuan, Germany, were unable to tell any difference between the alternator, even though the greatest output of the CW transmitters wasn't much over 100 kilowatts. In other words, they were uh, comparing the alternators running a quarter of a million watts at low frequency to the under 100 kilowatt tube transmitters operating at shortwave. No difference could be detected. So we just have to conclude that, boy, five boys in a coal shack in Greenwich, Connecticut, and one colder guy in Scotland, uh, you know, they did pretty good. So this was a huge, huge uh, event in the history of uh, radio communications. And we're celebrating that right now. So what we're gonna do now is uh, kind, of, uh, kind of interesting. No, it's not, it's very interesting. Uh, we're gonna apply uh, new science to old ideas. So uh, Mark is gonna do that. So I'm gonna unshare and Mark, uh, take it away. This is the uh, luxurious uh, Aquitania that uh, Paul Godley sailed on to go from uh, New York over to England. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the trip, not only Paul Godley's trip, but uh, in addition, I'm gonna talk about the trip that the radio waves took. Um, we have the opportunity today to apply some uh, new technology in the way of uh, free antenna modeling software to take a look at uh, the choice of antennas that uh, the uh, crew both in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut and Ardras in Scotland uh, took in order to pull this thing off. Uh, and a, a big part of that was a, a chance meeting on the Aquitania. So from Greenwich, Connecticut to uh, Ardras, and we've got 3,170 miles over a little bit of land and a lot of ocean. And uh, no trip by radio waves can be uh, talked about without talking about antennas. Uh, the great thing about the uh, transatlantic tests, uh, both uh, in Greenwich at 1BCG and over in Ardras, and is uh, they left us uh, great, uh, nicely uh, detailed documentation of the antennas they used. And uh, we've been playing around uh, at the AWA uh, Tech Center uh, with uh, antenna modeling software. Uh, the model of the 1BCG Marconi antenna was done by uh, Rich Place. So hats off to you, Rich, for doing this. 
Um, but you know, the trip uh, by radio waves wouldn't have happened without antennas and the engineers in Greenwich and Ardrossan um, made it a point to document what they did. Um, you know, they uh, were, had some constraints uh, in order to pull this off. And uh, well, first let's take a look at uh, uh, a azimuthal map. We'll put uh, Greenwich, Connecticut in the center of our world and we'll look out uh, over here towards our dross in Scotland. There's our 3,170 mile path. So wouldn't it be great if you could take all the energy out of your transmitter and just beam it like a laser beam across the ocean? Well, that wasn't gonna happen. Um, even though uh, by 1905, uh, Carl Ferdinand Braun had figured out uh, how to create phased array antennas. Uh, the only problem with uh, 1BCG was that uh, to build a phased array for 200 meters uh, meant constructing two or more quarter wave antennas uh, along with an extensive ground plane uh, in three weeks on a very limited budget. So uh, like uh, good hams everywhere, they looked and said, well, what's the best antenna we can build uh, with the constraints that we had? And uh, the current uh, wisdom was that uh, if you build a Marconi T uh, and uh, try to make it as efficient as possible, uh, you could pull that off. Um, they built this antenna at 70 foot vertical with a, uh, a cage. And then they had two 50 foot horizontal elements also built uh, as a cage with uh, these were 18 inch diameter cages, uh, horizontal and, and a seven inch diameter cage on the 70 foot tall vertical. Uh, there's also a ground plane below it consisting of uh, 60 foot radials. So, you know, although the Marconi T uh, um, was the best they could do, it wasn't uh, ideal in the sense of there was no directionality towards our dross. And here's the pattern of uh, the Marconi T, it's beautifully omnidirectional. So there was no favoring the uh, Ardras in Scotland, but uh, it allowed uh, people uh, around the world to uh, try to receive this. Let's take a look at this uh, again from uh, an Ardrossan point of view. Uh, here's uh, Ardrossan in the center of our world and uh, looking out towards Greenwich, Connecticut. And this is where a little serendipity kicks in. Uh, uh, at the Aquitania was leaving uh, New York Harbor, Paul Godley bumps into, of all people, uh, that hard-boiled ham, Harold H. Beveridge. And he proceeds to tell Godley about his recently patented invention, the Beveridge wire antenna, which Beveridge called a great static reducer. Uh, now, Beveridge was just not an average passenger. He also happened to be in charge of developing receivers for transoceanic communications at RCA Riverhead. So uh, a great guy to bump into by accident on the ship as you're leaving the harbor. Uh, Beveridge's antenna has actually been patented just earlier that year, uh, June 7th, 1921. And so it was a, a kind of brand new. Um, it's not an efficient antenna. Uh, it has a, a negative uh, you know, uh, gain number to it. Um, but receiving antennas at uh, uh, a medium wave and, and long wave, uh, they really don't need to be efficient uh, if they can uh, improve the signal to noise ratio. Um, that's the important thing. And beverages were very good at improving signal to noise ratio. So we take uh, the model of the, uh, the, the gain model of the beverage antenna and we overlay it on top of our map with uh, our drossin in the center, we see that we've got this uh, nice big lobe of gain from our drossin pointing out towards Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, kind of a dream come true. But as they used to say in the, uh, the Ginsu knife ads, uh, but wait, there's more. Um, Godley's beverage antenna also helped to reduce interference from the harmonics generated by the long wave commercial stations in Europe. Um, if you consider that, uh, we'll just take a look, let's say the gain out towards uh, uh, Greenwich, we'll call that zero. Um, the Marconi station at Clifton uh, was uh, reduced by 12 dB. The signal there was reduced by 12 dB. Um, Poldhu, another Marconi station, uh, that signal strength was reduced by 22 dB. MMU down 22 dB. 
FFU down 24 dB, and POZ in Germany was reduced by 24 dB. So it was a great antenna to improve the signal to noise ratio that uh, Paul Godley was experiencing on the uh, west coast of Scotland. Let's take a look at a map of that west coast of Scotland. Uh, he is right on the coast. And uh, this is a, a map showing where his receiver was, his beverage antenna ran out across this field and the terminated end of the beverage antenna uh, was about uh, 1300 feet away, uh, right almost at the, uh, right, right at the sea. So, you know, the beverage antenna's wires gain is achieved, um, or I should say maybe the reduction of the uh, uh, signals from the rear was achieved by a correct adjustment of a resistor at the far end. Uh, and this meant for Godley, it meant uh, taking a half mile jaunt from the receiver <laughs> down to adjust the resistor and then back to the receiver. Uh, and that's not all. The, uh, this is in a farmer's field in Ardrossan. And the farmers on the coast of Scotland at that time would haul seaweed out of the sea and spread it on their fields. So an adjustment of your resistor in order to improve your uh, signal involved a trip probably at night uh, through a deep coating of wet seaweed on a half mile trip. Uh, you really wanted to get that adjustment done quickly. Uh, otherwise you had a pretty good exercise program. Well, we only talked about, you know, two of the three dimensions that an antenna works on. It's a 3D world and uh, there is no line of sight path between Greenwich, Connecticut and Ardross in Scotland. So uh, a couple of bounces of that signal uh, between the ionosphere and the earth was gonna be required. And so we need to get some hops to get that signal from one end to the other. Uh, this chart here shows the uh, miles per hop uh, to the F layer uh, for certain elevation angles from the antenna. So uh, to get uh, from uh, Greenwich to Ardross and on two hops, uh, a takeoff angle of 10 degrees would be ideal three hops, you'd want about 22 degrees, four hops, 30 degrees, and so forth. Uh, so uh, ideally, you'd want to do this in as few hops as possible because uh, each hop uh, has a cost to it. And, and part of that cost comes from the fact that each time you bounce a signal from Earth to the ionosphere and back, you're increasing the length that the signal has to travel. And the other issue is neither the ionosphere or the earth uh, is this perfect uh, reflector or uh, refractor of radio waves. So there's a loss each time you get a bounce. And it kind of turns out that, uh, you know, if you consider uh, the fact that we had to have a minimum of two hops to go that distance, uh, three hops would have reduced your signal strength by four dB and four hops by seven dB and five hops by about nine dB below a two hop path. So they needed to, uh, it, it will be ideal to keep the number of hops low, which would be keeping your takeoff angle of your antenna low or the uh, takeoff angle of the receiving antenna. Well, if we look at the uh, Marconi T, the omnidirectional Marconi T in Greenwich, Connecticut, and we take a slice through it to look at the vertical gain pattern, we see the, the highest vertical gain is out here at 60 degrees. Um, and uh, that's right about at the four hop path. Um, the more desirable two hop path down here at 10 degrees has uh, less antenna gain. But if you factor in the gain from uh, losing a little bit of uh, signal in each hop, actually uh, the two hop path shown by this red dot uh, has uh, the best probability of uh, making that trip from uh, Greenwich to Ardrossan the uh, three hop path was a little worse, four hop path worse than that, and the five hop path worse. Um, but you do have some reasonable gain in the antenna pattern at the two, three, and four hop paths. So they had a pretty good probability that they could make it on uh, antenna pattern alone, uh, at least looking at it from the uh, Greenwich, Connecticut end. If you look at the Ardrossan end and take that uh, vertical gain pattern of the beverage antenna, uh, once again, the maximum beverage uh, gain is up there at 60 degrees, uh, 30 degrees above the horizon actually, um, and the four hop path. Uh, but the two hop path for the beverage antenna is only two dB, two dB below the, the four hop path. So that uh, chance meeting between uh, Paul Godley and Harold Beverage 
uh, really helped uh, uh, Godley out. Um, you know, he would have had no opportunity to use a beverage antenna in London because he needed uh, 1,300 feet. And there probably isn't any opportunity at all to, to lay out 1,300 feet of wire uh, in London. So although the Marconi T antenna in Greenwich was uh, as mutually omnidirectional, it, it did have some desirable elevation gain. And that beverage wire in our dross and uh, uh, had desirable gain both uh, uh, horizontally and vertically. And then uh, on, the, uh, on December 9th, uh, there's this entry from Paul Godley's logbook at 1250. After listening to some time for free for all sparks, we swing over to CW. And it is, it is indeed a thrill we get when one BCG is picked up on 230 to 235 meters. A harmonic from Clifton is jamming, but after some adjustment, this is partially nullified. I have no idea if that adjustment involved a, a half mile slog through wet seaweed or not, but he says signals from one BCG, very steady and reliable, remarkable performance. And I wonder what power he is using. So on December 9th, they knew this was going to work. Uh, they had some good RF engineering, uh, a nice chance meeting on an ocean liner. The official message wouldn't be received until December 12th. But uh, between the 9th and the 12th, I don't think they had any worries that they were going to be able to successfully complete this test. And with that, Ed, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Mark. That was very interesting and a, a new look at some... Uh some old data and uh, thank the uh, the boys that we call it the, the tech center or building three for uh, sharing that uh, the work and that they're they're doing and well, that is after all what we're doing here tonight with the uh, with the shares program okay next thing we're going to look at is uh, uh, some of the recognition of the uh, one BCG event back in 1921. Uh, 71 years ago, a dedication ceremony was held to install a one BCG monument and to bestow, interestingly enough, RCA Armstrong medals to the one BCG team, team, including, of course, Armstrong himself. Over the time, Armstrong has become a major player in. Uh, all things uh, technical for uh, wireless uh, communications. And the Radio Club of Ameri America decided to name their uh, medal, recognizing such activity, the Armstrong Medal. And here it is being, for the first time, uh, presented to the team, including Howard Armstrong. So let's see what the uh, what that was. Here's the, uh, uh, the dedication of the medal and the uh, dedication of the plaque uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut, not too far from the uh, uh, actual transmitter uh, location. Uh, I'll read this because I'm not sure you can see, see it well. Near this spot on December 11, 1921, Radio station 1BCG sent to Ardross in Scotland, the first message ever to span the Atlantic on short waves. Uh, 1BCG, an amateur station, was built and operated by members of the Radio Club of America, de dedicated uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, 1950. And here's the uh, uh, monument to today. It's really in a very nice setting, despite being a very busy intersection of two, uh, uh, two roads. Uh, it has a nice park-like uh, setting. It's very well uh, maintained, uh, thank heavens. Uh, let's move now to another uh, big event uh, commemorating the uh, 1921 uh, Transcon, and that is the 75th anniversary year in 1996. Uh, pictured here is Tim Walker, N1GIG. It was Tim who decided to generate a celebration of the event. Tim immediately got the AWA involved and also three 
local amateur radio clubs to help out. The Greater Norwalk Amateur Radio Club, the Stamford Amateur Radio Club, and the Shoreline Amateur Radio Club. With their call, which just happened to be W1BCG. Uh, so we owe a lot of thanks to uh, Tim Walker for heading that up and let's, let's see what he did. Uh, Tim uh, envisioned a week long event with on air activity, including a replica of the original 1921 one BCG transmitter that would be capable of US and European uh, QSOs. Enter the AWA. Uh, local clubs uh, would uh, uh, local clubs to be station operators on all bands and modes and assemble uh, the station. Further, the 1996 station should replicate the 1BCG style and location if possible. Well, let's see what. Uh, uh, what uh, Tim uh, found here. Tim found George Wells, a ham, uh, lived two miles away from the original 1BCG site, who was very excited to help out. And uh, George Wells, you see his picture on the left here, just happened to have a shack. And it was very, just eerily similar to uh, the 1BCG shack of 1921. Uh, uh, he also had, uh, just like the original shack had 80 foot uh, uh, poles, uh, this shack had an 80 foot <coughs> this, uh, this shack had a uh, 80 foot tower uh, with room for uh, antennas. So good find. It took no time for uh, AWA curator Bruce Kelly to open the muse museum facilities and vintage parts supply to build a replica of the 1BCG transmitter. The goal was to have the end product as close as possible to the original. So now we have good parts, we have good documentation, uh, but who? Well, it turns out that the uh, uh, AWA already had a very active uh, transmitter engineer that worked commercially for uh, radio stations. Uh, that was Bob Ray, W2ZM, and his son, uh, Mike Ray, uh, W2ZE, which some of you may recognize that call right away. Uh, later, uh, Mike got uh, 2ZE call sign, uh, which was Paul Godley's call sign, of course. Uh, this pair had uh, a lot of experience. They rebuilt uh, the AWA's Millen transmitter got that working, they scratch built the 1BCG transmitter and later on would build the uh, replica 1MO8FB two-way transmitter of uh, a couple years, uh, 1923. So here's uh, uh, the ye old transmitter uh, builders. And this is what they, uh, this is what they built. This is the, uh, boy, I can't tell you how close that is to the uh, to the original. Uh, so it's uh, 204 A's now because uh, 204 tubes are just unavailable. Uh, but this very comfortably runs uh, 375, now 400 watts on uh, 160 meters. It was on the air just uh, last Tuesday. This is a 160 meter antenna. Uh, that was used at the uh, 75th anniversary. This is the 80 foot tower uh, that uh, was on site. And all they did was gamma match uh, the, the tower and they used the same cage feeder uh, that they used at uh, 1BCG. And here's the bottom of it. You can see a lot of work, a lot of wires tying everything together. Uh, I think Mark uh, and the boys at Building 3 decided after a lot of testing that that didn't add very much. The boy sure looked good, made people feel good. So there you go. Uh, here's the transmitter in operation uh, 25 years ago. And look down below. Is there anybody that just can't get a wonderful feeling in their heart 
at 866 rectifiers burning bright blue. Uh, so that's the uh, transmitter working away at the, uh, at the 75th anniversary event. Here's the operating position uh, inside the, uh, the KA1JUV garden shed. A modern solid state receiver was used uh, at that time. And notice the transmitter has been shoved into a doorway and all the high voltage parts are in another room, literally. Uh, so that was done for safety uh, uh, reasons. The one BCG replica went on the air at uh, five o'clock on December 9, 1996, uh, with Tim uh, at the key cranking out QSOs on 1.812 megahertz. 800 plus uh, QSOs were logged with that uh, transmitter during that uh, few day period. A special QSO uh, happened with W2RCA, which is the club station for the Radio Club of America with the RCA sending congratulations to the crew for a job uh, well done. Other bands logged over 1300 QSOs on 80 through 10 meters on both phone and uh, CW. And this was the uh, certificate uh, sent to uh, uh, participants and participants and people uh, working W1BCG. Uh, we also had quite a few SWL reports uh, from across the globe who uh, copied the message and uh, uh, were sent the same uh, certificate. So that was the, uh, the 75th anniversary. And guess what? Now it's the 100th anniversary. And there is a lot uh, uh, going on. Uh, we want to uh, point your attention to a, a new website set up especially for gathering all of the many, many, many on-air operations. And that's www.1bcg.org, 1bcg.org. And that site uh, you can go to uh, anytime and look at uh, uh, activities that are, uh, are going on. The Radio Club of America had one activity that was uh, uh, November 13th, just last weekend. And there's many, many others listed, including those from the uh, uh, AWA. Later on, uh, we don't have all the details firmed yet, but in uh, uh, January or February of uh, 22, uh, the one BCG transmitter will be put on the air again, only this time for two-way communication. Just inviting as many people who can who can uh, get a 160 meter signal into beautiful downtown Bloomfield, New York. We are there. We're going to be there and anxious to work as many people as possible, as well as uh, eagerly seek uh, uh, QSL uh, SW. I'm sorry, SWLs uh, who may want to uh, listen in and, and participate. If you want just a couple books in your library uh, talking about this era, uh, I suggest uh, 200 Meters and Down by Clinton B. DeSoto. He published this book in 1935 and just never stopped. There's always been a demand for this book. So it's still available from the uh, ARRL uh, bookstore. And uh, the the document uh, is the one uh, uh, published by the uh, uh, Radio Club of America. And that was published in 1950 at the same time as the uh, commemorative plaque was uh, installed and the medal of uh, RCA medals were issued to the uh, uh, participants. Uh, so this, uh, this is no longer in print but it is available at 1bcg.org and you can go there and uh, download it. 